let's have a go. So the plan, plan for tonight is to run through a few introductions, some of the stuff um, you will have, have, have seen before, look at some of the aims and objectives for tonight, um, and do a little bit of a, a recap, and then really focus on uh, the idea of process thinking and that idea of being under pressure and pressure management. That's really the subject of, of tonight. Um, and if we get to a point where we where we feel that we've got a few things that we can put into action, then that'll be that'll be pretty good going. So the idea is bring us back into ease you back into the mindset of uh, being a butcher referee. You know, I think this was exactly the same uh, objective from when we met. It was that beginning of December? Um, so two months ago plus, I suppose. Um, and, and that's still the case. We still don't know what, quite where we're at, but that doesn't mean that we, you know, we need to put everything on hold. So tonight will be a way of easing ourselves in. There's no tests as we go through it. There's nothing where there's no trick questions or anything, but it'll help us get the cogs going a little bit. Uh, the secondly, to introduce pressure management strategies. That's one of the things that we ended up on. We started to look at that a little bit. And that idea, and we finished of process thinking, and that's going to be the main thing that we're, we're going to look at. The main strategy that we're going to look at is, is process thinking. But you're not just going to hear from, from me tonight. I have um, enlisted some top international referees from uh, around Europe to send in some videos as well on some questions that I sent them uh, around, particularly how they cope with certain scenarios as well. So we'll do a bit of work and then we'll come um, and towards the end of the session we'll hear from top international referees with some of their top tips for you um, some of them were very nervous about their English um, but uh, they contributed some some really great points and some stuff which I hadn't really thought about so that's always good to have that widespread uh, input from from people so that's the plan for tonight somewhere between 60 and 90 minutes um, or so. And we will look at some, some match play, but this is less about video analysis as such and more about, like I say, process thinking and developing our processes. As usual, I like to start with a disclaimer. Last time I had Steve up here, I think it said, uh, we all make mistakes and then had a picture of Steve. Today it says, we're not robots. Uh, and I guess that is one of the key things that I want to get to across tonight. It's very easy to talk about process thinking uh, and to say, if you do this, 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 and this, then you're going to achieve this, this, and this. We see that a lot in adverts on Facebook and all of that kind of stuff. And we're not robots. The stuff that I'm going to talk about is, is, a, is, a, is I guess, a way of, of thinking for you to take away from tonight and to apply to different uh, botcher scenarios because we are all different and we all have different styles. If you've ever seen me referee and if you've ever seen Cassandra Turk referee, we referee in very, very different styles. We do things in a very different way. It's not that one is right and one is wrong. We're just not robots. So we're gonna talk about things, about putting things into steps, breaking things down, putting things into processes, but these processes should be your processes and they're not necessarily standardized across the board otherwise there would be no point in having butcher referees we would just be butcher robots so that's the disclaimers out of the way let's hit with a bit of the recap we've got most people i think were on it last time uh, but a few people are new so what we looked at last time was we started with this uh, dunning kruger effect and the idea of this was to look at the idea of confidence up the left-hand side and wisdom, or we exchange that for experience. And the idea is to reach botcher guru status. And tonight, hopefully, we will take one step closer to botcher guru status. Um, and we talked a little bit about this curve and how when we start, we, you know, we've just done the rules, we've just passed the, the, the course, and we feel like we know everything. And we can go up that mountain very, very quickly, but actually we're very inexperienced. And often without that wisdom, without that experience, even though you have all of the knowledge, you end up making a mistake. And what that does is really knock your confidence. And they call it the value of despair. And the idea is to 
kind of scale that slope of enlightenment, these terminology is not mine. Genuinely, this is the, their terminology, not mine. But to uh, scale the, the slope of enlightenment, to get to a plateau of sustainability, that is where you are a good referee and you can referee well throughout many, many competitions, lots of different scenarios. We talked about this and how we could move along this and how if we're new to it, we might feel we're very much at the start, but not everyone has to fall into the valley of despair. And often what happens in the, the reason you fall into a valley of despair is because you've made a mistake. Often mistakes come when you, one of two things, one is you've lost concentration. And the second is you struggle with it, with a pressured environment. So they're the two fundamental, the two main reasons why we end up making mistakes. We've lost concentration or that we've um, we've kind of buckled under pressure. And they're, so they're the things that we're going to look at tonight to hopefully mean that you skip the value of despair and you go straight to the plateau of sustainability. That is the dream. That is the dream. So that was how we kind of framed last time. And we looked at the fundamentals of refereeing and this whole concept of how you referee is more important than knowing everything. Uh, and I showed a picture of, of me in my youth having just qualified as international referee. And I said something down the lines of, I probably knew more that day than I do right now. Then the following picture was me doing an absolutely terrible measure. <laughs> it was an awful measure. And that was the experience element. I knew everything, but I didn't have the experience. We are going to come back to this notion of uh, you know, how you referee is more important than knowing everything right at the very end, because one of the international referees has some really wise words on this subject. Uh, and so we're kind of going to finish today off by going full circle and coming back to this slide. And what we talk about, when we talk about the fundamentals and how you referee, what we actually mean is body language, procedure and communication. And we used a video clip from the World Cup in Liverpool a few years ago, which had um, a referee who probably did not display the best body language, the best procedure or the best communication. And if those of you who remember that clip, um, it didn't go particularly well. We are going to look at that video very briefly um, because most of you were on the call last time. So it makes sense to look at the same um, video again, but in a, a new context that we're going to talk about tonight. But we're not going to dwell on, on that video in particular. We're then going to move on to, to something else. But that's the fundamentals, body language, procedure and communication. And that's where we started to look at managing pressure and when do you feel pressure? And a few people started to, to share their, their stories about when they felt pressure. And often it was around, you know, critical moments in a match. And that's what a measure is. It's a critical moment. It is so close that you can't judge with your eyes who's going is next or who's scoring. And so you end up having to go to different pieces of equipment to have a look and to check. And often that means that the players are called out and are looking over your shoulder and it, that is a critical moment in the game. And that's where we often um, feel that pressure. Now, one of the things that we're going to talk a little bit around is why do we feel that pressure? And what do we do when we feel that pressure? Well, we actually end up with a stress response. And that stress response essentially means cortisol. That's the hormone in the body that deals with with stress and that soaks our body and the idea i'm sure you'll have heard of fight or flight the idea of the cortisol is that it shuts off different systems in your body to allow you to focus all of your energy into one thing so faced with a grizzly bear or a lion back in the day you don't need your digestive system in that moment probably helpful that you didn't have a digestive system in that moment but the idea is that you then would use all of your energy in order to get away, fight or flight. One of the other side effects of cortisol is that you can end up with cloudy thinking. Now, cloudy thinking, what do we mean by that? Well, I'm sure you'll have experienced this probably on a botcher court. Well, you've just, you've gone for a measure and you've just measured it and you get up and you go to tell them and you go, oh, what was it again? Oh, I need to measure it again. And you just lost it. You just lost that thought as to what it was. And that's that 
cortisol has soaked you. That's that little bit of your uh, heart rate that's elevated, your breathing that becomes slightly shorter and your palms potentially are a little bit sweaty. That's that stress response, the cortisol going through your body and it can leave you with cloudy thinking. Now, typically, most people, most of the time, it's not a problem. For other people in other roles, it's more of a problem. One of the pieces of research that I looked into for this was a piece of research around firefighters. Yeah, and how do they cope with this cloudy thinking when it comes to those stress moments? Well, for them, it's really critical. Now, I'm not likening a botch court to life and death. However, there are absolutely times, certainly in an international referee's um, career where you're refereeing players who, if they lose that game, they lose that medal or they lose that chance to play in Tokyo or potentially they lose their government funding. And these are the kind of things which mean that we can, that can kind of add pressure into an environment that makes things critical. And we start to feel that pressure. Now going back to that Dunning-Kruger curve, we also, pressure is a good thing. It allows us to be in the moment, to know the moment. It's also really easy to not feel pressure in moments where we maybe should. And that's often inexperienced. Maybe you don't quite know the gravity of the situation. It can be caught out a little bit. But that's where we looked at, started to look at managing pressure and the idea of Breathing, humming, and focusing. Now, breathing, very easy. We can, we can do that, and I do that a lot on the botcher court. Humming, not so much. But the focus element was where we kind of finished off last, uh, last session. And the idea was around breaking down your tasks into small parts, prioritizing and going through step by step. What does that mean, and what does that bring us to today? Part two, process thinking our cheesy photo of me and Tony, head referees a year or so ago. I think the last time I was a head referee, so it feels like an absolute age ago. Process thinking, that's what we're doing tonight. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. So one of the things I'm going to look at is the coaching world to get us started. In the coaching world, we talk about reflective coaching a lot. If you've done level one, you will recognize this slide because it's taken from it it's exactly taken from it the idea of you know delivering a session reflecting on that session improving yourself talking with the athlete in order to be better have you met your goals have you met your objectives and we look at this slide as to how you reflect when you reflect and it's all very lovely let's reflect to be a better person I want to introduce you to this guy. He, this is Gary Klein. He looks probably, I don't know, like the most, most boring man on earth. <laughs> pretty, pretty much, I think grey is the word I would use to describe him. As a, but he is, a, he is a clinical psychologist and he's done some really interesting work in pre-mortem. And we're going to talk about that in a second. And that's going to be really the focus or the, the pivot the, the, of today's session is going to be around this idea of pre-mortem. And what he would say to reflective coaching and reflective practice, this isn't me, this is Gary, just to be clear, because I also deliver the level one coaching, but is that reflective coaching and reflective practice, mm, it's great, but that's post-mortem not pre-mortem. And what we're talking about today is going to be pre-mortem. Natalie, I can just see there's a few people uh, in the waiting room keeps flashing up on my screen. Um, and there's a difference here between officials and coaches. In the world of Botcher, it's small, and we often are both people, aren't we? We're often coaches and officials. And this is where we need to flick between different mindsets. And pre-mortem, the whole idea of pre-mortem is that it is the opposite, obviously, of post-mortem. Post-mortem is when something has gone wrong, why has it gone wrong? How do we deconstruct it to stop it happening again? Gary Klein's thesis is on pre-mortem. We should be doing everything in advance in order to make sure that things don't happen. He calls it prospective hindsight. 
and how it can significantly enhance our decision making. Going back to those firefighters, this is part of his research. The idea that they know exactly what they are going to do in any given situation. Yes, there's variables, but they understand the steps because they've worked them out. Their training shows what to do in certain situations, how to react. So when they're into that situation, they've been it. The process is already in place and all they need to do is execute. That's And this is really what we're going to, to look at today. Now, they he often talks about going back to the future is the phrase that he uses, going back to the future. And that's the idea of imagining a project has already failed. Let's make this botcher. Imagine your match has already declined into terribleness and pressure has got to you and mistakes are happening left, right and centre. So that's where we start with. And what this does is allows for a level of certainty. If we know that something is going to go wrong in the game that is about to happen, it means that we can discuss and identify the threats. Why would it have gone wrong? What is the likelihood? What is the potential magnitude of, of the, you know, the, the thing going wrong, the, the mistake that you've made? And therefore, what are the key challenges? And have you gone into, into it with any presumptions? So going back to the future allows you to, and again, this is his language, not mine. He talks about his imaginary time travel. And what it does is it punctures your overconfidence, simplifies thinking and reveals blind spots. What do we mean by these things? Punctures overconfidence. You know, I'm as guilty as anyone of saying, oh, it'll be all right. Yeah, it'll be all right. Got this. No worries. You know, you could say if I'm being unkind, oh, I'll wing it. I can wing this. I can. Don't worry about it. What that really is, is. Yeah, overconfidence. It's not recognizing the pitfalls that are ahead and what they could be and to how to kind of, um, I guess, mitigate against them. When you start to do that and you start ahead of time in this pre-mortem thinking what could go wrong from this game, which is going to fail, it allows you to simplify your thinking. You cut out all of the stuff which is you know, the, the periphery, and it allows you to focus, simplify. And what it also does is reveals blind spots. So we're going to look at a game in, in, in a moment, and it's going to be a measure. I'm actually I'm just going to show you a picture, but the game is between two players, a Chinese player and a Thai player. Now, I wasn't doing pre-mortem before <laughs> at this point, at this stage, but if I had of, one of the blind spots would have been, I don't speak Thai and I don't really speak Chinese. That is a massive blind spot. How do I mitigate against that? And that's where, you know, by thinking about things in advance. Now, he's coming very much from a business world and from a public health world, hence his work with firefighters. And so I am, you know, uh, appropriating his, uh, his thesis essentially into botcher, But it really does work. It really does work. Because ultimately, pre-mortem, all it is, is process thinking. It's figuring out what the steps are, what you would do in a situation, and then executing that in the moment. That's all it is. But thinking of these processes in advance, rather than, you know, oh, I've made a mistake. How am I going to improve on it? Oh, well, I need to do this, this, and this next time. If it was a semi-finals of any tournament, that next time might be okay for you, but for the player that's lost, actually, that could have you know, a material effect on, on them. So if we can do that thinking ahead of the match rather than post a mistake, then we're going to be in a better situation as a referee. The players are going to have a better experience and the game and you and your level will significantly go up because of course if you do post-mortem especially after an effect what you've potentially done is ended up in that valley of despair you've come off that confidence peak and you've dropped because you made a mistake but this is botcher you've got what 15 minutes before your next match <laughs> let's let's be honest we don't have much turnaround time 
So what ends up happening is you go into that next match and you don't even do a post-mortem. You know, you don't really concentrate on this or think about the mistakes that you just made, but you just feel awful. But you've got your next match and then you're tired and then you can see how that very, very quickly snowballs. And whilst we've got this time of COVID, whilst we've got this time of, you know, botcher on pause, this is just a really great time to process, think, to be pre-mortem about our botcher refereeing. So this is what we're going to do tonight. We're going to break into uh, small uh, breakout rooms in, in a moment. And what I want you to do is you're going to do a pre-mortem on uh, a measure that I'm going to show you. And remember, all a pre-mortem is, is what could go wrong and how to mitigate against that risk. If it was a post-mortem, it would be what has got, gone wrong and who's to blame. Pre-mortem is what could go wrong and how to mitigate. And by listing those two things, it'll help you form a process. So how would you do things? In what order? So I'm going to show you the photo now. Um, we're going to put you in breakout rooms in a second. So if I could ask you to get your phones out and take a picture of this, uh, of this photo, because when we go into breakout rooms, you won't have... You won't have this in front of you. So if I get you to take a photo of it, um, then you'll remember what it is for when you go to your breakout rooms in a second. So if I'll just give you 30 seconds to do that. Okay, I can't quite see everyone, but if I will assume that that's okay so far. So just to reiterate, you're gonna go into groups and you're gonna do three things. One is look at the scenario and make a list of what could go wrong. Secondly, how would you mitigate that risk? And how does that therefore form a process for you? How does that form a process for you? Okay, shout up just now if, uh, if we've gone too fast at, that, at this stage and you don't know what you're doing. Otherwise, Natalie, if we can go into breakout rooms, that would be great. So hopefully that was uh, a, useful, uh, a useful thing to get us thinking, to get us started. So we're, we're going to ask for some contributions as to kind of talk us through what you think could go wrong in this situation, what you could do to stop it going wrong, and, and how does that affect your, your process? So um i've just got rid of the list of who was in which group so um forgive me if i uh natty do you want to just pick a group that want to just say a few yeah. ideas so we'll go lauren's group first if you like yeah so lauren's group just if you could just highlight a few things as to with this scenario and this measure what could go wrong what have you got in your list uh the biggest thing we said was that ball four is probably the problem ball um because it's on top of five and two by the looks of it. So that's mm -hmm. probably the ball that we need to go most careful with and determine relatively quickly whether that's a scoring ball or not because of where it is, if that makes sense. And the effect that that will have on potentially moving one and three to get to two and five, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so the, the, what could, the what could go wrong is referee error, you knock a ball. Knock, in... knock four, yeah. 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 I mean, any of the balls, like you said, but yeah, four is probably the one that we'd be most concerned about in this situation, I think. Yeah. Good. Anything else on the list as to what could go wrong? There's many things that could I go mean, wrong. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> Obviously, knocking a ball is the biggest, um, whether that's before you measure or during the measure. Um, players knocking a ball, I guess, because number eight is out of the way a little bit from the head. Um, so making sure that players are in a good position to see what's going on sort of keeping an eye on the other balls that are on the court and making sure that nothing else is getting knocked or squished or anything, really. Yeah, so that's a good one. If we, if we take that as, as a what could go wrong, how do we mitigate it? What could go wrong? The ball, the players could interfere with the head, uh, potentially disrupt it, a worst case, worst case scenario. How do we mitigate that? Well, we need to get them in a position where that's not going to happen. But we have to balance that, don't we, with 
well, they've got to be able to see the head. Otherwise, you're going to do a mission and they're going to just keep asking you to do it because they've never again really, and again and again. yeah, never really seen that. So from a process point of view, where does where does that fit? Positioning of athletes and, you know, if you were to list them one to 10 or what, I don't know how many levels you came up with, but where do you think that positioning element comes in? Yeah, we didn't really talk about that um, to much extent, to be honest. It just sort of passed. But personally, that's probably the first thing I do. I don't really get myself comfortable and in position until I know that the athletes are happy with where they are. I sort of stand where I'm roughly going to sort of then perch. But as long as the athletes are happy, I don't tend to get onto the floor and get comfortable until the athletes are in the right place because it's pointless me getting comfy and then having to move and then chairs moving and whatever um, so that's probably the first thing for me. Uh, well, that's a piece of insight, isn't there, to a young person, a young referee getting comfortable on the floor. Um, it's uh, It's been a little while yeah. since I think yeah. I've been comfortable on the floor, let alone some of you folks that are, that are yeah. on here. I won't name names. Yeah. Yes, Thomas. Can I say something? Yeah, absolutely. We, we also said about... Um, about getting the play agreement about what what to do or what to move. So oh. du- during during not just at the end of the final score, but making sure that they they know what you're about to do and you kind of get little mini agreements. Yeah. Um, because what's what's the risk? That's what you would do. What's what's the actual risk? What could go sorry? What could go wrong if you don't do that? Well, it could open um, a whole kind of room, like um, one player could disagree with the other player, and then it could go to a pier or the head Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, what could go wrong by? you not communicating well as to what you're going to be doing or what you are doing, it might mean that you don't bring the the players along with you for the measure. Ultimately, you need their agreement at at the completion of the end. So it's not that you have to formalise it at every single stage, but it's about bringing them along with you on the measure if you want to be a good measure. And if you don't do that, then one of the risks is they disagree with you, then they kick up a fuss. You may well be right, you may well be right, but if you just haven't helped them along with that, you know, I always, I, I love rugby referees. Um, rugby referees are, are some of the best referees. And I love that they're mic'd up because they talk to the players. They tell the players what they're going to do. If you do, if you continue to do this, then I'm going to blow my, blow my whistle. You know, they tell them it's a rook or a moor. Keep out number 12. Like they do all of this stuff. They help the players along to keep that game flowing. So I think that's a really good point. Communicating not just with the final score, but also during the measure itself, just to keep them on side. It's not that you need to get their agreement at every point, but it just brings them along on the journey. Yeah, that's a really good point. Natty, is there a, a, another group maybe that's got something else? Shall we go Catherine's group? Yeah. Katie and Rob? Uh, take it, Katie and Rob, you want me to take this? <clears throat> We were looking more at, as we said, where would we position ourselves on court, uh, and where would we, you know, where would we see the, um, the players being positioned, and then, you know, the types of measure we could do, and we kind of figured on this one, it's going to be a vertical drop measure. Um, so we want to get ourselves in a good position, make sure the players have a good um, view of what's happening, and what we would want to do is maybe determine quite early doors if the five was a scorer so maybe that would be our first measure would be the jack to the five and then um jack to the two i know this is not doing what lauren's suggesting (laughs) but then the jack to the two because you can see the overshoot quite easily and then the jack to the four it does actually look from this picture the picture i took was much smaller that the four is actually up in the air but I think if you knew the jack to the five was closer than the jack to the four, then you're kind of protecting yourself a bit from that referee error of nudging the ball. Okay, so yeah, I, I guess that's what I want to get want to get back to. What you've described is is, I guess, the order of things that you would 
do, which is great. That's helps form the process. But that's kind of the third element of what we're trying to do. I guess what I'm trying to do, first of all, is what could go wrong? Like, let it, well, and again, so... For us, it was definitely the balls getting knocked and yeah. whether you could move a ball. And we decided that it, you, you couldn't really move any of the cluster of one, two, three, four, five. But what you might want to do if you had to um, is move eight with the agreement of the players saying it's not scoring. Because this has to be an end score because it couldn't be who's playing yes. next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it is. So um, it would be a get, get the agreement of the players to move the, you know, remove the eight so you can get in there if you needed to um, because it's not scoring and get that agreement saying it's not scoring, move it out of the way, fully out of the way so you can get in and um, get your measure in. Okay, so let, let's let's focus on that bit a little bit around moving the ball. So you've got the agreement, as Thomas has said. Um, looks like you're going to measure it in a different way to to Lauren, but like you say, we're not all robots, so that's that's fine. So you've removed the ball and you've said make sure that it's not scoring. What could go wrong? Well, one of the things could go wrong is you forget which ones are scoring and which ones aren't scoring because you know you've moved them and then you've gone in for a really difficult measure you get that um you know cloudy thinking that we talked to talked about because the cortisol is drifting through your body and giving you that nervous uh, stress response and you kind of come up from a measure and you're not quite sure if that's a scoring one or not how do we mitigate against that idea of a ball we've moved knowing that it's scoring or not scoring so if it's scoring i would put it on my paddle on the color mm -hmm. So if it, it was a red ball that was scoring, I'd put it on my paddle, on the red side of my paddle. That would tell me that was one scoring ball I'd moved because I don't forget that that ball scored. Yeah, exactly. So I think um, often because we like to get ahead of ourselves, we, we jump straight to the to the process. And actually, we you just touched on it and a really great valid point around the paddle and how we use the paddle and different um zoning a measure differently and that's uh, I was going to put that as, as a slide I thought no, it sounds a bit pretentious doesn't it to, to zone a measure but that is what you're going to do when we see the video of this you will see there's quite clear zoning that that happens where the balls are where the players are where the paddle is where the scoring pile is and the non-scoring pile you'll start to see that it's 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 zoned and and that really helps with that mitigate that risk of mixing the balls up um you, you've moved them legitimately but then when you actually come to score at the end you've forgotten whether it was scoring or not and just simply by putting your paddle uh you know the balls that score on top of the paddle and the balls which aren't scoring not on the paddle is just a really easy way to do it so that, that was really good natalie should we go to Peter's group? Peter put something in the chat a moment ago as well. So that's, yeah, Peter, Colin and Ted. Who do you want to speak? Me? Thank you, Colin, yeah. We've just about covered everything that, that we talked about. I mean, lots of other things could go wrong. Like eight could get accidentally kicked or stood on because it's, it's of no interest. So... The problem is you might just ignore it completely. Or if you got the, the players out, they could squash it with a wheel or whatever. Um, but that's only a minor, minor problem. My, my biggest problem would be trying to measure five with, with three in a way. Okay, yeah. So I think one of the things that you have to look at, to, to touch on the point about eight, um, the easy answer or what you might think is the obvious answer is just remove it, just get rid of it. But actually that's not what we would do as, as a referee because we want to move as few balls as possible. And we can, you know, there's plenty of space around it. You know, it's not in, it's not in the way. And Colin, you're exactly right. If it does get kicked or nudged, unless it gets kicked or nudged into the head, which again, based on the positioning as to how you position them, um, that would be very difficult to do or should be very difficult to do then it's kind of immaterial, but yes, you, you're right. Eight as an outlier often means it's out of your peripheral vision as well, and you forget about it. So that, that is absolutely something that, that could, go, could go wrong. Um, your second point is around identifying what you want to measure and then how do you get to it? Like, how do you get to the measure? Catherine talked about a vertical measure earlier, and... Um, 
I would probably hesitate with a vertical measure. The reason being for a vertical measure why I hesitate to, to use it is because, of course, we measure from the centre of the balls uh, to the centre of the balls, from, from where my thumbs are to where my thumbs are. And if a ball is touched up against it, well, actually, the closest we can get to is actually, you know, two th a third up and not in the middle of the ball. Does that make sense? So if you've got two balls that are butted up against each other, sorry, they're two red balls, not a red and a blue. That would have been clearer, wouldn't it? A red and a blue. If you do a vertical measure, you're not actually measuring the middle of the ball. And we all know as to how to do good measures, we measure center to center. So I'm not saying that I would never do a vertical measure because I'm sure that there are some circumstances under which that would be the only way to do it. Um, but there are other ways to do this, and that is by systematically removing balls uh, in order to get to the measure that you that you want. And ultimately, the measure that you want is, well, between butcher ball two, six, and five. They're the measures that you're trying to that you're trying to get to. So I don't know um, which groups have haven't spoken but if one of the groups could say how would you get rid of or how would you measure two six and five and what would you do what steps would you do in order to to be able to measure two six and five um if i might come at this we yeah. had a um a question in rules that if we ignore this for the moment and we just imagine you're doing it you would might call out your liner and you both oh, is there someone else in the group that could... and then you measure in between to stop the balls from moving you broke up a little bit there john should i try again yeah or is there someone else in the group that could maybe uh that could maybe share that I can. Yeah, go for it, Roy. Yeah. Um, what we really discussed was <clears throat> obviously the measuring, uh, removing uh, one and three onto the paddle. And then at number four, when moving the one and two, could fall. And we discussed about bringing the liner out to support the four so we could measure the rest of it. Does that make sense? Is that Jan? It is, but it was along the lines of we measure from flat. We were, we were. Uh, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? I wonder, John, if you take your video off, we might be able to hear you better if you take your video off. Okay. Can you hear me now? Go for it. Okay. So when you're on the flat, you might call your liner out and then you both cup a ball and measure. And we were questioning whether your liner could cup ball number four, whether that's allowed on the basis that it's not actually touching the floor. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> what I would say is um, don't get hung up on ball number four, on ball number four. It's not a trick. It's not a trick uh, picture. And I'm not trying to trick you, but I can see how it might look like it's it's oh, up in the in the air. But actually, ball ball number four isn't. Don't worry too much about it. The balls to worry about is two, six, and five. And one of the things that you said is using your liner. Um, so I guess what could go wrong? Well, when you're extracting a ball you are you know, likely, especially if they're butted up against you, and especially with these super soft balls where you end up with a lot of surface area, a lot of surface contact, they can get quite sticky to each other. And so when you pull one out, it rotates the other uh, that, it, that it's stuck to. And so to mitigate that risk or that, that thing that could go wrong, to mitigate that risk, you can use your liner to stabilise the ball. But of course, that brings in and of itself its own set of risks one is in in this game it's single bc2 so not much risk but if it's a pairs bc4 that means that the liner isn't with the players and um the coaches and the assistants and so 
by bringing them in, you may well add risk. Also, it may well be that actually, ultimately, what they're doing is touching another butcher board that you wouldn't have done before. And so they themselves might have a little wobble. They themselves might get that hit of cortisol and start to get that little bit of a stress reaction to them. And likewise, as I said, some of the butcher balls are so soft that if you put any sort of weight on them, um, then they kind of could change shape as well. So some people do uh, do that. In, in the video um, that we're out to show, we, we don't use the, the liner in order to, to get rid of it. In the commentary, they actually, which I'll, I'll mute it so you won't hear the commentary, um, they actually do suggest using a, a liner. And that is a perfectly uh, acceptable thing to do. Just in this, in the scenario that we're going to look at, we ch chose not to. Um, yeah, don't get hung up on, on ball number four. It's really between two, six and five. How do we get to those those measures? Is the one last group that hasn't spoken, Natalie? Yeah, and I, think we'll Jenny was going, misery. I think Jenny was going to speak up. I think oh, yes, we, were, we, we were just thinking as well to bring in a liner, but we were actually thinking to stabilise the jackpot and five so that we could try to remove three. Yeah, yeah. But and potentially it's different, okay. different ways of looking at it. Yeah, it just so, I don't know, it, it's just that, that would that's occur to us to be, it, as you can't actually see how much contact there is on the balls, it's quite yeah. difficult to make a decision. Because if there's too much contact, obviously you couldn't move three. But ideally, I think, um, with help to stabilise the jack and five, removing three would give you a much easier measure on the remaining balls. Yeah, and what you're doing, Jenny, is you're starting to, you know, this is a, you know, a, an, an abstract clip. It's literally a, a, a frame from a video. So I understand the context just isn't there. But what you're starting to think of is, well, if it was this, then I would do this. But if it was this, I would do that. What you're bringing in is evaluation through observation. And that is absolutely part of the process that you that you should go through. And you might think it's just, oh, I hadn't realized it's that. I was just looking at it. But actually, that's what you're doing. And as you gain an experience, you get better at that evaluation. You could say you get your eye in a little bit more. And after this time, you know, after this COVID period, like we're all going to be so rusty, aren't we? Our eyes are not going to be in when it comes to this. So you'll probably find that you're going to end up relying less on your eyes and judgment and probably doing more measures in the first place to get, get your eye uh, back in. So I think we've talked to everyone about it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the video uh, just now. Just uh, as a disclaimer before I do, uh, I am the referee in this. Uh, I did not pick this video. Uh, this was sent to me to be done. And I am not saying that uh, this is the only way to, to do this measure. So there's a few disclaimers before we before we kind of get into get into it. So you can see here, again, go back to that language thing, the, you know, when we're doing that pre-mortem, not going to be able to speak English to them. One last shot. So that's the scenario with one ball to play. So you can see how the ball rode up and that was probably where what it looks like in that video clip and then it does drop back down. So first thing, already done it first thing. You'll have actually seen it before you played. I looked down at the, at the head just before he played. And I will tend to stand in exactly the same place pretty much for every shot when it comes to a head. The reason being is because I like to look down just before they play to get that snapshot in my head. As to if, this, if this all goes horribly wrong, if I really cock this up, I remember what the position of the balls were and I can put them back really quickly. Again, we saw that last time round when um, the referee spent so long between uh, when the violation happened, putting the balls back, but she couldn't remember where the balls were back. So I take a little snapshot before every every shot. And then as soon as the ball is, is played, just double checking, but I'm going to them. 
telling them what the score measure come out. So immediately I'm communicating, I'm using the BizFed um, uh, gestures. So you can see, uh, that's my mistake. I probably screenshot just a little bit early. So I was trying to say, don't get distracted by four because that is the fin finishing position um, of, of how they are. And you can see it's um, ball, what would be ball number five, that blue ball is just because they got pushed on, it's even more cramped than it was before. So bringing them out, <clears throat> We talked about zoning before, and you can see I'm starting to set up a zone. First of all, they can see it, but what I want to be is in the best position. I want to be able to see it. I've just set my paddle out and to the side. You know that red's winning because I've set the paddle to red on the upside. Really clear, really simple. We've got a head. We've got a, We've got the, the head. Of, and we've then got the players. We've then got the, uh, the referee. And we've got the paddle. And to the left of me, is the non-scoring zone. So we've zoned it quite well. We know from this angle, they're not. he's not going to kick the ball. They're in manual wheelchairs, not electric wheelchairs. So we know, I know that if they're going to move the chairs towards the head, it's going to be quite a big gesture. It's not going to be just a subtle movement of the thumb on, on a joystick that's going to get them closer. So I know that I'm in control. I've also got the ease of being a BC2 match, so no assistance. But you can see that the assistant has come up, assistant, um, uh, the line has come up to, to observe and is just making sure that uh, the spectators aren't getting too involved. So that's the first thing that we've done. We've set our zones up. We've communicated with them, set our zones up, got them in position and set the paddle and now immediately looking to the players making eye contact and telling them what I want them to do and this is what I think it was Thomas came up with this earlier on was around communication so I'm telling them exactly which ball it is so they know what I'm going to do and I also explain how I'm going to score it so if scoring balls I'm going to move them and then I check that they're okay and now this is the start to be the extraction so I know that I need to measure ball two, five, and six. So ball number one there that I'm moving, I can move out relatively easily. Yes, it's in contact, but if I go straight back and I'm quick about it, and this is one of the key things when you end up getting really good at practicing with different balls, we'll talk about practice later, is how you extract the ball. You'll notice when I get in position, I take my time, and then when I extract, it's really quick. And what that does is it breaks the tension, the surface tension between the balls and allows it to go to move back without having to have an assistant in place. So I'm in place, and then you bring it back out. Single finger, I'm not going too much about it. I then move around and explain, I need to measure ball number five. So and six so this is the ball i'm going to measure this blue that i've just pointed at so i'm saying if it's not scoring i'm going to move it there he's then said i want to measure it i'm trying to explain there that look between ball number five which is the blue uh ball that's i guess closest to the players you can see there's a red ball between the the jacks there's enough space for a whole ball and between red number two, I'm sorry, I keep mentioning the numbers, but uh, if you've got it in front of you, you can still look at it. You can see that there's not a ball space, but he still wants a measure. I'm communicating with him. He's moved forward. I'm not worried because I'm absolutely in position to protect the head if I, if I need to. He's asked for a measure. And I've said, if I'm not going to measure it, then if it's a non-scoring, I'm going to move it off to my left-hand side. So notice I've just altered my position. I was in this position. In order to get that good measure, I'm now just going to move a few inches around to get that good measure. Next thing I do, get the calipers out, rotate the cal calipers. You notice just before when I got them out, red was going to be on red and blue was going to be on the jack. Rotate them to get the contrast right. The contrast is good for two reasons. One is for you because, but also for the players, this makes it a bit clearer. It's also one of the reasons the Botcher England calipers are black and not red and blue. And if you, you know, think historically in, in old calipers, or if you look at some of the handy life calipers and things, they're all red and blue, but actually the Botcher England calipers are black and they're black for a reason, not just because it matches our, our um, kit, but it's to allow that contrast. You don't have to worry about matching the caliper color to the ball. Now, at this point, 
it's easy to rush, but there's no time on, absolutely no time. And I know if I get this measure, I'm only going to need to do one measure if I get this right. If I get this right, I only need to do one measure because I think this is the closest ball. Get up, move around. Straight through. Very clear. Told him it's not to move it. Tell him I'm going to move it so I can measure those two balls. Got the thumbs up, as Thomas was saying, extract the ball. Notice calipers, move them back out of the way. Haven't altered them, haven't touched them. They're still in the exact position. Now I need to extract that red ball. And that was the difficult one where the where the referee, uh, where the commentators were saying you could use the, the liner and you could have in that stage. But if I had have used the liner, if I go back to this, I would have had to have moved the players because the player, the tie player, would have been in the position. And I would have, I felt that there was more risk in moving the players uh, because they were in good view, they had a good position. And there was probably more things that could go wrong in that situation than, um, than if I did it myself. But that's a judgment call. Extract it. Put it on the scoring side. Calipers not moved, so I don't need to remeasure. The measure is already good, so I don't have to worry about that. In position, drop it in. Tell them it's the score. They start to move back, get them back in position. Confirm it, end finished, move on. So, yes, I've talked through here this one, uh, this one example, just because we have it, have it on tape. But it's worth saying that it's not exclusive to that. What I went through was a lot of the stuff that you will have gone through or you will have done. So this is when you're thinking about process, oh, talk about process, talk about spell check, uh, process thinking uh, when it comes to... to measuring these are the the 10 or 11 steps that we go through that i just went through and it was a complicated measure yes but it wasn't impossible and actually this is the process that i'll go through for, for everything first of all i'll do a visual check do i even need to measure okay i need to measure approach communicate to the players invite them out position yourself with the best view place the paddle with the winning color side up tell the players why and what you are measuring identify and obstructing balls and remove them and then evaluate again because actually removing those obstructing balls might mean you don't need to measure at all it might mean that your eye can now adjust and it's obvious um, so just check at that point have an evaluation once you've removed those any obstructing balls then it's measure and remember just do as few measures but make them good measures make them good measures Communicate, communicate throughout the process, check your findings and confirm once they're in the box. That's the process. And we just applied it here to the BCT final at the World Championships that was being live streamed. And so this is the idea of, yes, was my heart rate elevated? Absolutely. Was that cortisol soaking my body? Yeah, absolutely. But what can I turn to? Well, I could turn to process. And this is the process that I'll do for everything. Now, yours might be slightly different. You talked about in there about how people would measure slightly differently or they would choose different balls slightly differently. And like I say, we're not robots. That's how I dealt with that situation. Would I do it exactly the same if I had it again? Maybe, maybe not. I, I don't know. But what I do know is if you were to have another video of me refereeing and measuring I probably do this order and I probably, I probably do this process and in this order. Now you may well do a lot of this already because you've just got good at it. You've just experienced, you've just got good at it. But the whole idea of a pre-mortem is not just about process. It's about thinking about what could go wrong, how to mitigate against it. And we know that measuring is one of the biggest risk factors when it comes to, when it comes to botcher refereeing. The biggest factors is uh, is measuring. So what can we do to mitigate against that? Well, lots of things. Practice is, is one of them. But what we're going to do now is that I went out to um, 
a, a number of the international referees to ask for some top tips on different things and some experience. One of them is on, on measuring. And actually, one of, the, one of the referees, her top tip is something that I haven't even considered in, in my uh, process. And I now am thinking about putting it into my process because of her top tip, because of this, because of this course. So I'm really thankful for her suggestion. Um, a few of them have messaged me and said uh, to apologize for their English because it's not their first language. Um, I think it's, you know, I can't really speak Spanish or Flemish. So I can't really, I can't really, um, you know, say that it was good or good or bad. All I can do is uh, I'll probably just reiterate what they've said as we as we kind of go through things. So I think now I need to make sure that if I am sharing with my sound as well. Sorry, that's a, you know, you know, something just see on the beavers site, and you're going about the process. Uh, if I was refereeing, I would obviously need someone to make it for me. And they would probably have their own process. So, you know, what would yeah, you yeah. speak to you? Because obviously everybody's different. You think you just just let them go for what they would, you know, make it for? So, should I take the lead? Yeah, Lewis, that's a great, it's a really good question. And actually, before we move on, you know, if anyone does have any other, other questions at this stage, this is the, the time to chirp up. But to answer Lewis's question, it's, it's a really good one. The way that I view it and the way that we teach it in, in England is that the referee is the referee. You are the one that's in charge. You are the one making the calls. And the liner is simply to do a job for you. Now, that might be to cup a botch of balls for you to get a good measure that might be to do the measure for you. Yes, they're going to have their own process, but ultimately when it comes to positioning, when it comes to choosing which ball you want to do and in what order, that's your choice as the referee. You can ask them for their suggestion because they might get a better view than you if you're refereeing from a power chair. Yeah. But they, they are your assistant. You are the referee. You are in, you are in charge. If you want them to measure ball two rather than ball three first then that's what that's what you say you're you're in charge um, and they are just simply there to to assist you now if, again like i say if they've got a different perspective and say oh uh, have you thought about this and listen to them obviously you know yeah. we're here to support each other um but ultimately it, it's you're in charge you're you're the you're the referee it's a good question lewis is there any other questions actually on measuring or on those the things that we just talked about before we move on i've been watching the um, world barrels and the calipers that they use a screw they've got a screw in the middle it's like um i can't remember what they're called but they, they actually got a threaded screw in the middle to to move it in and out. Yeah, to lock them, lock them in place. Yeah. Never use them on butcher. Yeah. So the reason, um, first of all, there is no, there's no set rules as to what is a measure and what isn't a measure. All the rules say is that it needs to be pre-approved by the head referee. So if you go to a competition, Colin, and you've got one of these fancy dancey things, show them to the head referee, and if the head referee says, "Yep, yeah, that looks good." Uh, then, then you can use it. One of the downsides to using that, and from when I have looked at them in the past, is how quick you can use them. Uh, so they're really good for staying in position, for locking in place. But from what I understand, you generally unwind them or unscrew them in order to open them up. And depending on yeah. the distance, that could take a little while to do. Um, so I, I completely take take your point and. Uh, as far as I can see, if they if they measure accurately, it's a tool that you feel confident in. I don't know why a head referee would say no to them, um, but just know that there's potentially a um, well two elements. One is a speed element, and of course bowls they're much bigger, mm -hmm. so it's much easier often to kind of manoeuvre around them a little bit. Because I, if I seem to remember rightly, the calipers also often have a little flick on the end. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that means that looks good, but actually means that you can't measure things which are 
as close as you would do with botcher calipers. That's a good point. Thank you, Colin. Yep. Okay, so we'll move on then um, to the last little bit. And all I wanted to do in this bit, the, the stuff I just talked about measuring there, the idea is to show and uh, to kind of give an example of how we would go about the processes and ultimately what uh, I guess the call to action if we were to to call it that is post this is, is to for you to think about your game and to think about your process now whether that's between ends whether that's uh, measuring whether that's how you communicate and sign off players get the batches signed off like what do you actually do rather than just falling into a habit which of course you haven't pre-thought about and so is more likely for, for things to go wrong. We get that overconfidence. Often that happens, doesn't it? And in fact, uh, I even remember, uh, I would say who it was, but I think it was a possibly a level two or level three assessment. And they kind of got to the end of the game and they relaxed so much, and but then weren't able to finish the game off properly and ended up, you know, they thought the game had finished when the last ball had finished. But as we all know, the game doesn't finish until the, everyone signed uh, and so it's very easy to switch off at certain points uh, of the game, whether that's at the start because you're just starting, whether that's the end because the last ball's been played, but actually the game isn't finished at that point. So think about your processes all the way through. But what I wanted to do is to hear from a few other international referees on some of their top tips. So I'm hoping you'll be able to, to hear this. And uh, if you need a little bit of translation, uh, I'll, it will come up on the screen. Hello. I'm Maria. I'm an international water referee from Spain. I love the subject of measurement. And in my opinion, the best tip I can give you is the following one. First, I would observe it calmly for a few seconds to decide which tool I should use and in which way I'm going to perform the measurement. In order to do so, you have to know the different tools. So good, okay? And you have to have practice for long at home with balls of different, different things you have, okay? Thank you and see you. Yes, that's Maria from Spain. Um, her top tip, and this is one of the things which is not part of my process and I'm thinking of, of putting it in, is she has a look at the head and then decides which tool it is. And again, your question, Colin, was kind of timely there, wasn't it really, about the tools that, that we've got. And I've got a picture of uh, Martina on the right-hand side, who's another international referee, one of the best referees, uh, and also is great on Instagram if you want to follow someone who loves and knows and um Grams all about botcher regularly, then definitely follow follow her. But Martina, uh, yeah, she um, she's using her hands there, which is what you uh, should not be done. Is not how you do it. Mm -hmm. Maria's absolutely right. Choose the right tool. Your hand is not the right tool. Your foot is not the right tool. But actually, is it the calipers that are large? Is it mini calipers, or what? Is it feeler gauges? Is it a long measure? Now, and there's always going to be transitions, isn't there? About 30 centimetres, I would say, is that almost transition between a tape measure, maybe 45 centimetres, is that transition between a tape measure and the caliper. And the calipers are kind of wide and a little bit clunky and a little bit difficult to use, but tape measures are never fun to use either. So choose the right tool is her top tip. And a second top tip, very simple, practice, practice, practice at home you know I, I am guilty of this i do not practice at home anywhere near as much as i should do and what ends up happening isn't it is you get to that first measure on a, on a competition on a weekend and you know what it's the first measure you've done since the last time you did botch it you know two months ago or whenever it was and suddenly you're practicing on core but remember the consequences of mistakes and you think about pre-mortem thinking when it comes to it if you if the last time that you did a measure was you know the previous competition well the the potential for you to make a mistake is really high in comparison to if you practiced even just the night before 
get your eye in, keep it in. But she really has practice, practice, practice. She uses, you know, she said you could use anything, you know, rolled up socks, apples. It doesn't really matter. But that idea of practice, practice, practice at home. So the next time you measure isn't a match. And I really hope that speaks to, you know, to, to everyone on, on this, this call is however long it is until we get to the next match. Let's make sure that the next time you measure isn't the first game back. What can we do as referees to be ready for it? So thank you, Maria, for that. Now, the next one that I asked her, asked was around staying switched on. And what do I mean by this? Staying switched on. Well, let's be realistic. Not every botcher game is a blockbuster, is it? You know, some of them can be pretty tedious, can be pretty long, and it's easy, easy to make mistakes. We saw it. This is the video. Um, from the uh, the previous one, the previous um, session that we did, I'm going to put it up here. You know, you could see here that you've got this is the first end, so just getting settled in. No scores are on the board. Everything's going smoothly here. She maybe is not a switched on. You could see she's not engaging with the players around her. She's just looking at the one player. She knows who's going to play, so she feels confident in it. She's not making contact, eye contact with the uh, with the liner. BC three, this can happen so easily because it can be so long between shots. It's so easy to miss something. So you'll just see, just in a second, that stool move, a split second, she missed it. I don't quite know how, but she did miss it. But she's not switched on here. So again, she hasn't looked at the players to see in the whole of that process. She hasn't looked at the liner in the whole of that process. The liner switched on, got it, nailed it. And we talked about this last time. Where is she now looking? Well, she's tracking the ball and not the liner. She then misses the liner. It then hits. And then you can feel that cortisol just shooting through her body. That stress response is absolutely kicking in, which is where those foundational things about what makes a good referee comes into play. And we kind of know what, what happens from here. It takes an awful long time to get sorted. We end up needing the head referee to come over. The head hasn't been replaced. There's a communication error. Communication is difficult, sorry, because we've got Portuguese in Brazil. Um, she speaks English. We've got a Spanish head referee with but first the uh, French Canadian French speaking head, assistant head came over. Hadn't thought that through. So going back to this, staying switched on, how do we do it and why is it important? Well, I asked uh, my friend and international referee Ronnie to, to speak on on this. Hi there. Thanks, Richard, for the not so easy question on how to uh, keep your focus during a game uh, that lasts long or uh, a quite boring uh, game. It will happen during a tournament. You have a few of those uh, games. Important is, and not the first one who will tell it, uh, who says that you have to keep focused, stay focused, because anything can happen. Uh, one player that tries to disturb the other one inappropriate communication between player and um, uh, uh, the coach that can happen and that will happen they notice they see it they feel it when the referee is not in the game you have to give the feeling to the players that and the uh, coach that you are in uh, the game you have to stay uh, in the game you have to see everything um, what can help um, look around Watch player number one, watch player number two, if you have a pair and if you have a team. Try to make eye contact with uh, several uh, players, all uh, players. Watch the, uh, the, the timer, watch the liner that the players can see and the players watch from. The referee is slowly look, 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 uh, looking around, he is uh, seeing everything, he is in the game. First of all, that's important. What helps with me is uh, that I 
try to imagine uh, that uh, I'm in the position of a trainer or the position of uh, a sports commentator who is observing a game and who is giving comment to it. So I try to keep in mind why is playing this ball? What is he going to do next? What will the opponent think now? What is the opponent maybe uh, maybe when he's, uh, when he's turned to throw? What is he going to do? That's something that helps me be a bit of a commentator, be a bit of a trainer, to stay in the game, be not distracted by surrounding noises or, or whatever, think what, what dinner you are going to have or what breakfast you're going to have or what kind of beer we'll drink later on. No, stay in the game and maybe those tips can help you a bit. Good luck. Yes, that's great advice by, by uh, Ronnie. Be a commentator. That's how you stay in the games. If you're a commentator, you've seen those matches and you know they have to fill a lot of dead space. But if you're a commentator and you have that attitude, you're going to stay stay in the game. And interestingly, I asked the same question um, of another referee, Tony, and he kind of came up with a very similar answer. Well, sometimes it's difficult to concentrate when you are having an easy or boring game. So when it happens to me, what I try to do is sometimes I, I think like there's another referee somewhere else who is not watching the the mat so i try to mentally relate all the mats to this person I, explaining okay now blue is throwing uh, i can see he's not stepping on the lines the assistant is at the right at the right place and just trying that person to have a mentally idea about what's happening on the mat or it could be also like Imagine that the referee is for this match is his first time there, and from from other place you are explain, giving some advices to him, like please make sure they are not stepping on the lines, make sure the assistant is at the right place, make sure you did the right measure. It's like uh, telling someone else everything you are checking. Makes you stay there and focus on the match. This is my top tip for you. Enjoy. So, so that's Tony. I just need to clarify. I realise there's a lot of clanging of gates and sirens. He's not in prison. Uh, I could tell you, like that is just how, how he looks. He's a physio working in a special school in uh, in Valencia. He's not in prison. I promise you. But it's interesting, isn't it? His top tip very similar to Ronnie's in the sense of. He's trying to explain it to a brand new referee and going through his thought process. He's training the new referee. And that's pretty much what a commentator does. And that's how he stays switched on. But that's the process. Again, going back to that idea of process thinking, what works for you might be different than works for someone else. It turns out, and I had no idea they were going to say this, both Ronnie and Tony, a Belgium and a Spanish referee, both think and look down similar lines when it comes to this. Now, the last bit I, I just wanted to, to mention to round off these two sessions in total was the idea of going back to one of the earliest slides that, that I showed, the fundamentals of refereeing, where I said how you referee is more important than knowing everything. And yes, that is true, but that is not a reason to kind of put your books on the shelf. And the reason being is, as our, our last uh, guest uh, says, and this is around uh, not staying uh, switch on, this is on around conflict uh, management, essentially. The question I asked her, uh, despite what the title will say, it was around uh, how, to difficult with, uh, how to deal with difficult scenarios, coaches or players becoming emotional and upset with you. Hello, sometimes uh, when you are referring, uh, you make a decision on court and then a player or a coach disagree with your decision. And this can, can make you get nervous or panic. So the main thing to avoid this situation is always uh, make the decisions following the rules. If you know perfectly the rules, and you make your decisions uh, under the rules, uh, you always are going to be sure that you are 
making the correct decision. So when a player disagrees about your decision, disagrees, sorry, about your decision, the only thing you have to do is, in a calm way, explain the player the rule. Not your decision. It's not a, something subjective. It's something objective that is written on the rules. So the only thing you have to do is explain the rule to the player and try to make sure the player understand the rule, the player understand your action following the rule. And if not, don't get nervous because uh, we have the head referee to help us. So we only have to call him or her and explain him the situation. And if I repeat, if you make your decision under the rules, the head referee is going to decide the same thing as you. So the, my, top tip, my top tip about this situation is study the rules, read the rules, make your decisions following the rules, and then you are going to be confident and calm on court. Bye. So there you go, study the rules and make your decisions according to the rules because the decisions that you make should be objective and not subjective. Yes, that is absolutely, absolutely true. And uh, it doesn't go against what I was saying earlier. You do need to have both in order to reach botcher guru status. This is the stage that we're trying to get to, botcher guru status. Because if you know all of the rules, but you don't have the fundamentals to apply it properly, to have the correct body language, to be able to communicate well with people who may not speak English, then actually you're going to really struggle, even if you know everything. But likewise, you might have the best bedside manner in the world. But if you never went to medical school, you wouldn't want them as your doctor, would you? It's that kind of idea. They might be have the best. You might be the best. Um, referee when it comes to how you communicate, how you talk, but if you ultimately do not know the rules and do not make your decisions according to the rules, you will end up in trouble. And that's where you end up in the valley of despair. So to round off these two sessions, how do we go to get to a plateau of sustainability having scaled the slope of enlightenment? One, know the rules know the rules. Two, be like Gary, pre-mortem. Think about the processes that you do. Think about the match play or the competition of the weekend that you're about to go into and think about all of the things that will go wrong. Not could go wrong. Think as if they have gone wrong. Pre-mortem. Think about post-mortem, something's already gone wrong. So assume that things are going to go wrong. What are the risks? How can you mitigate them? Be like Gary, pre-mortem. And thirdly, practice, practice, practice. This time has been difficult for us all. You know, it's been, oh, I don't know, over a year, I would probably say, since I was last on a botcher court refereeing. And we don't know when the next one is going to be. So I'm not saying the next thing you need to do is cancel your weekend plans in order to get the uh, books out watch um, Gary Klein's TED talk and, you know, get your socks and pineapples out in order to, uh, to do some measuring practice. But in your preparation to return to court as a referee, if you do these, these three things, that is how you master pressure. That is how you do it. It's not rocket science. If you can do those three things, you will master pressure and that will be how you end up becoming, you know, a botcher guru. So there you go. That ends our session over uh, the last or well, over two, two uh, Thursday nights, Wednesday nights even so that we've been together. I, I really hope that it's been useful for you to, to think about, you know, some of the things that, that we've covered. Uh, I'm happy to stick around now um, for the next 10 to 15 minutes to answer any questions or to, to chat. 
that's not a problem at all. But likewise, I know we are seven minutes over the allotted time. So if you do need to dash away, I won't be offended at all in the slightest. But I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've got something from it. Um, and I really hope to see you on court soon. I really, really do. So thank you very much and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And thanks, everyone, for, for joining. It's good to see you all. I'll follow up um, via email as usual and hopefully we'll see you on some of the, the other upcoming sessions as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you, everybody. Richard, can I ask a question? In that ball set up, if the balls had been squashed, you would have still tried taking the balls out if you thought you couldn't move them or... It's just when I looked at it, one of the balls, looked, the number, is it number three, the one that was between one and five, looked like it had flattened sides. So I wasn't really thinking about moving them. Yeah, it, 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 all, it all really does depend. I mean, the other thing that you will have done um, is you've been in equipment check. And how many times have you in equipment check where they check each other's balls and you don't watch? Like, I'm not saying you, sorry. <laughs> As a referee, we don't watch. We let them, we think it's a process for them. Actually we can understand the botcher balls and also if it's bc2 match we we're giving them out have a little feel not squishing a squash but you know understand the kind of how dense it is if there is if there are going to be any any issues and you'll recognize that in the ball so you will understand before you even a ball is is thrown you should have an understanding as to the characteristic of that ball or again you could have it and again when we talk about processing processes that applies to call-up room, doesn't it? it? You know, the whole process of you being a referee, apply that. So use the call room, not that you're going to get your hands on there, but you're going to watch them. You're going to listen to what their comments are and their coach is going to tell them as they round it on the hands or the play, they're going to say, oh, it's soft. You can understand the characteristic of the ball. And if you apply that to you as a referee, you can make that will be the difference between you making a decision to remove the ball ask your assistant or to do uh, you know, a vertical measure as we, as we mentioned before. Thanks very much. Will it, will it hurt? Hi, Dan. Uh, um, as I don't measure, how would I practice measuring? Yeah, good question. Uh, first of all, you can still practice your positioning. So, you know, if you've got a set of balls, which I presume you have many, um, mm. you know, you could you can get them dished out and you could still move around the head because ultimately it's your decision as to whether you measure or not. Mm. And actually getting into the right position or seeing the head from different angles might mean that you don't need to get your assistant to measure in the first place. Mm. So that's one of the things that you can practice that very first stage of evaluating the head, observe the head. Do you mm. even need a measure? And then if that is the case, then, you know, yes, you can, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to practice calling on someone. But if you have got a PA with you or something who, who likes a bit of botcher and is happy to get into it, then, yeah, think about it as to what language you're going to use. Now, you know, we've known each other a long, a long time, but I haven't spoken to you for a while and it still takes a moment for me to tune in <laughs> to your voice. Now, remember a sports hall environment with a referee, with a liner who, who doesn't know, who doesn't go back 10, 15 years like we do. So maybe one of the things that you could practice is your communication as in, I'm going to use these set phrases. And you could share that with the liner ahead of the match in the call room, if we're lucky enough to have a call room. So you could uh, you know, have set phrases so they know exactly what you're going to say. Uh, we say that a lot in coaching, actually, uh, for people who, you know, maybe use a Dynavox or a non-verbal, it's like cue card, figure out ahead of time, again, pre-mortem, what do you want to say when you're coaching? And it's exactly the same as a referee. What language do you want to use as, as a referee to communicate well with your liner for you to get what you want because you are the referee, done? Right, thank you very much, everyone. Natalie, Rich, Tom. Right. Nice to yeah. see thank you. Thank you, Roy. Good to see you. See you, see you soon, Dan. Yeah, bye bye yeah. now. Yeah. Thanks. It was one brilliant night. Brilliant night. <laughs> when you're in the call room, when the guys are passing the balls between each other to check what the opposition have got, would it be okay for the ref to get in there and have a squeeze? <laughs> 
no, probably not. That that would be taking it a step too far. Um, but you can absolutely observe and listen, listen to the the comments between the assistants or the coach and the players. Yeah. Listen to what listen to what they're doing. And you know what? Between and you know, if it's a BC two match or something like that, then you're you're going to be you're going to be giving the balls back after the warm up. So have yeah. a little squeeze then. Have a little you know, run run your thumb over it. I've got two boxy balls here. One is you know matte, but it's actually very very slick. This one's glossy, yeah. but it's really sticky. And I just need to you know when I'm walking back to run my thumb over, it and I know that this ball, if there's another one attached to it, is much more likely to move than than this one. And yeah. again, you know, between different softness and hardness, a ball that can be soft compared to this, you're going to know, and you get that just by when you're returning the balls. You just have that's when you have a little squeeze, Colin. Don't squeeze the balls too early. You have a little squeeze on when you're giving them back. Yeah. 